Hello everyone, welcome to What If Is A Different Short Stories Collections Movie 2. Before we start please go support Nagash Black Hand for writing that awesome fanfic. This is the translated version I made, there will be some wrong he or she calling here because it's translated so let me clear this essay is a male in this story. Story 1 What If Issei Got Reincarnated to Fairy Tales World. Issei the Devakian. Clarifications before the story. 1 In this story Issei will be sent to the world of Skyrim, why? Simple, this game plus its history with dragons and the magnitude of missions and things you can do, gives an immense capacity to create a high quality story, of course you can only do it if you know how to exploit it. That's why this story will be a bit slow as far as updates are concerned. Due to those who don't like an op character, I'm sorry, but this is a story will be very op. But if you have seen Overlord and you like it, I think you won't dislike this story at all. Without further ado, enjoy. The beautiful landscape could be seen, with small paths surrounded by abundant vegetation, both flowers and trees. The place was surprisingly quiet, anyone would want to be in that place just to enjoy the atmosphere. Which was broken by a roar. Suddenly, from one of the entrances of a cave, two people came out, a blonde man with semi-long hair with a small braid on his left side, which reached his shoulder, he was tall with a build worthy of a warrior. His clothing consisted of an outfit, apparently from a kingdom, blue and brown. Without a doubt that man was a Nordic, it was normal to see Nordics in Skyrim. The second was a young man of apparently 18 years old, with black hair with brown highlights, he was wearing brown pants, just like his partner, but unlike him, he was not wearing any upper clothing, revealing his well-worked body. These two men, apparently relaxed, had just escaped death, either being decapitated or burned by the flames of the dragon that attacked before their execution. Ralf. We've escaped from the Imperials, thank you very much for your help, without you, I probably wouldn't have gotten far. The blonde man said to the brown-haired man, who looked at him and then answered. They say. Same here, it wouldn't have been easy to escape without your help. He replied and then shook hands with his new friend. Ralph. Haha, you have incredible swordsmanship, not to mention your talent with magic. You probably could have managed without me. They say. Thanks, but it wasn't that big of a deal. He said, not wanting to brag. Ralph. Whatever you say, haha. There's a relative of mine in Cospascoso, she can help us. Let's go he said to be stopped by the brown-haired boy. What's wrong? He asked, surprised. They say. Go ahead, I'd like to explore a little. He said calmly making the Nordic sigh. Ralph. Okay, Wooded Creek is further down this path. I'll be waiting for you there. Don't take long. He said and then began to walk. Until he reached a point where the chestnut tree was no longer visible. They say. Sighing to think that I would have a second chance like this. He said remembering everything that happened before getting to where he was now. First he was killed by his date, Rainer, who turned out to be a fallen angel. Then he woke up in a kind of palace room. In which a so-called god of time and space apologized to him for having made a mistake. At first, the brown-haired boy had no idea what was going on. Until the god explained to him that he really shouldn't die, in a way, since he should have been reincarnated as a devil by Rhea's Gremory. But due to an error, Rias didn't send her familiar, so Issei could never summon the redeed. To fix that flaw, the god had to delete that timeline and create a new one, as a result of another Issei being created. Therefore, the old Issei couldn't return to his world. As compensation, the god allowed him to choose a universe, any one, he would create it and let Issei live a normal life. He also gave him three gifts, which were the possibility of choosing three skills, powers or gifts that he wanted, that when he appears in the new world, be it the ability, magic or anything, the brown-haired boy would know how to use it perfectly. The brown-haired boy, once he calmed down, asked to go to the world of Skyrim, that universe of the Skyrim video game, had always caught his attention. Once the god created the universe, Issei said his three powers, which were the following. One being able to perform any magic that has been seen in anime, manga, history or movies. Do have an unmatched skill with any weapon, being able to add any element to your weapon, strengthening both attack and defense, in addition to being able to improve your own attributes with these elements. Three change his appearance to that of Natsu, only his hair would still be brown, but with black highlights. After saying his three wishes the god sent him to the universe of Skyrim, being the protagonist of the game, that is, the Devakian, thus appearing in the mythical card at the beginning of the game. And this brings us to the present, where the brown-haired boy had managed to escape from Aljuin. They say. Side would be better to go towards the forested channel, but I will try one thing first fly. After saying those words, the chestnut's body began to fly until it reached a height of 30 meters, being able to see the landscape in front of him. Which for the chestnut was the most beautiful he had ever seen. After several minutes of flying, he decided it was time to go to the forest river, so he headed there. When he was at an acceptable distance from the town, Issei landed and then headed towards his destination on foot. 
it wouldn't be good for anyone to see him flying. After two minutes of walking, he was able to spot the entrance, where Ralph was waiting for him. Ralph. It took you a while, did you have any problems? He asked looking at the brown-haired boy, who shook his head fine, let's go in, my sister will be at the sawmill. He said as he began to walk followed by the brown-haired boy, who couldn't stop looking at the town. After crossing a small bridge, Ralph's voice brought the brown-haired boy out of his thoughts. Ralph. Sister, how are you? Jurder. Ralph what are you doing here? Ralph. The Imperials ambushed us, I just escaped from Helgen with a friend he said, looking at the brown-haired man without him I probably wouldn't have made it. Barter. Please follow me. He said to lead the two men to a log, on which Ralph sat down, however the brunette remained standing next to the woman, who, if he compared her appearance with the one she had in the game, he was sure that in the game she was another person. Even though it was normal, in 2011 there was not much in terms of graphics. But the difference was huge. Barter was a woman of apparently 25 years old, with smooth and slightly tanned skin, probably from working in the fields, after all, a simple hat doesn't do much. Her blonde hair was tied in a high ponytail, which reached the bottom of her neck. Honestly, the brunette was amused by how in the game she looked like a 35-year-old woman, and here she was 25. But again, his thoughts were interrupted by said woman. Barter. So a dragon attacked Helgen, thank you for helping my brother, you can ask us anything, if we can, we will. He said looking at the brown-haired boy, who just smiled slightly. They say. I don't need much, just some blue cloth, leather and steel. He said watching the woman nod. Barter. No problem. I suppose it will be to make armor and a weapon, right? I asked, receiving a nod from the brown-haired boy. Very well, go to the forge, I will bring you the materials. After saying that, the woman left, leaving the two of them in the place. Ralph. We better go to the forge, I want to see what armor you'll be wearing. He said as he headed to the forge, followed by the brown-haired boy. When they arrived they waited a few minutes until Garter arrived. Garter. Here you go, now I will call my husband to make you whatever you want. They say. It won't be necessary, I can create it myself. He said while placing the materials on a table. Garter. Do you know how to forge? I asked curiously. They say. No, but I have my tricks. He said as he reached out to the materials, which began to fuse and mold, creating the brown-haired man's armor and weapon. Ralph. By Talos, how did you do it? I asked, surprised by what the chestnut had done. They say. I'm a high-level magician, I can create anything as long as I have the materials. Garter. Impressive, I've never heard of such magic. It's incredible. After saying that, the brown-haired boy surrounded himself with a light along with his new armor, which he exchanged with his old clothes. They say. It was a pleasure to be with you, but I'm afraid I should begin my journey. He said taking his katana and placing it on the side of his waist. Ralph. I hope we meet again someday, though, and if you want, you can join the Stormcloak cause. They say. I'll think about it, since I don't plan on joining any faction. Ralph. Okay, if you change your mind, go to Ventalia, Ulfric will surely remember you and let you join. He said goodbye and went to rest, since he had not slept for several days. They say. Well I should go now, there is something I can do for you. He said looking at Garter, of whom he already knew what he was going to ask. Garter. Yes, indeed. If there is a dragon loose here, Jarl Belgroove should know about it, so he can send soldiers to protect Wooded Creek. Could you do that for us? They say. Of course, where is Jarl Belgroove? I ask even though I know the answer. It wouldn't be normal for a newcomer to know where everything is. Garter. Located in Whiterun, north of the Forested River, if you follow the path you will reach the foot of the Turin on which the city is located. They say. Thank you, I'll go right away. He said goodbye and left for the outskirts of the village. Once he was outside, he flew again, but instead of heading towards Whiterun, he went towards the mountains, more specifically to the Bleak Fool's Mound. If he remembered correctly, inside he could find the stone that Ferenger, the court sorcerer, would ask for his research. In addition to being able to find the golden claw, with which he could ask the merchant of Wooded Stream for a reward for recovering it. The brown-haired boy only hoped that the story would be like in the game. If not, he would have problems. After a few minutes of flight, he managed to reach the entrance of the tomb, where he could see four bandits patrolling. Upon seeing this, the brown-haired boy landed and then walked towards the bandits, who upon seeing him unsheathed their swords. Bandits. Get away from here if you don't want to die. He said threateningly as he walked ahead of the rest of his group. But the brown-haired boy ignored him and continued walking. The A-N-D-I-T-2. Haven't you heard, boy get out if you don't want us to kill you in response, the brown-haired boy unsheathed his weapon, and from one moment to the next he walked between the four bandits, the last thing they heard was the sound of the brown-haired boy's weapon being sheathed, as seconds later they fell dead to the ground. 
After putting away his weapon, the brown-haired boy continued walking until he was in front of the entrance, where he stopped to see his enemies already dead. This made the brown-haired boy wonder if it was normal that he didn't feel anything after having killed. But, taking it lightly, he entered the tomb. Upon entering he could see the same thing that was in the game, two corpses of bandits next to some skeevers, in addition to the two guards at the entrance to the dungeon. Without thinking much, the brown-haired man quickly killed the two guards, then looted the chest next to the ladder, in which he found two mana regeneration potions, 34 coins and a silver ring. After collecting his small loot, the brunette headed towards the stairs, which would lead to the catacombs. But before going down, the brunette remembered that in this type of dungeon, there were Draugrs, undead Nordics. Thinking about that, he remembered one thing, which could give him many options for the future. After thinking a little about what he could do with his new idea, he decided to carry it out. At that, the brown-haired boy turned towards the four corpses lying on the ground, then extended his hand, from which a kind of black mass emerged, which went towards the corpses, then wrapped them. After a few seconds of silence, the mass began to grow, both in size and height, until it easily reached two meters. After a few more seconds of waiting, the mass retreated again towards the brown-haired man's hand, thus revealing some undead in black armor. Issei. Death Knights. A new partner. Issei stared at the two death knights he had created, thinking about all the possibilities that were opening up to him with this ability. But a voice brought him out of his thoughts. A very powerful ability, if used well of course. Issei. Who are you? Show yourself. He said as he stood in a combat stance alongside his two new guardians. I doubt you'll find me outside, since I'm sealed inside your arm. At what the subject said, the brown-haired boy looked at his arm to see a red gauntlet with green gems. Issei. Who or what are you? And what is this thing? He asked cautiously. To begin with, my name is Drake, the Red Dragon Emperor. And you are my new bear. He said, causing the brunette to become confused, since he did not remember any gauntlet with a celestial dragon sealed in it, he even doubted that a dragon with such a title existed in this world. Issei. Explain yourself. Greg. It's simple, do you remember what that fallen angel told you? He asked surprising the brown-haired boy, who after remembering what she told him, understood that it was the gauntlet. Issei. So you are the sacred gear that Rainer mentioned right? But how come you are here? Greg. It's simple, it seems that God created another drag for the new timeline, therefore I stayed with you. Issei. Well, at least I'll have someone I can talk to without any problems, I guess that's okay. He said making the dragon laugh. Greg. Haha, <laughs> same here, my bearers didn't come out to talk to me much, only to get power or help in combat. Issei. That sounds depressing. He said while well, creating a portal and ordering the death horses to enter. Greg. In a way. But leaving that aside, what do you plan to do with your new servants? I asked, curious about the idea the brown-haired boy had. Issei. I don't know much about politics and such things, but I can understand that a war like the one in Skyrim causes cities to lose resources, generate discontent among the population and more things, which will lead Skyrim to doom. That's why I plan to end this myself. Greg. And what good will the Death Knights do you? He asked, even more intrigued by his companion's plan. Issei. To sum it up, in the game there is the possibility of joining one of the two sides, but at the end of the day, I have much more information on how to run a country than any of these lands, especially because of the age we lived in. That's why I plan to form a new faction, declaring war on the Empire and the Stormcloaks. Greg. So you plan to conquer Skyrim, but you haven't thought about the villagers. They say. Yes, the plan is simple, I will be the villain and the hero at the same time. He said confusing the dragon. Greg. And how will you do that? I find it very difficult. Issei. Remember that I can use any magic that also applies to shape-shifting magic. For example, I can transform into any and I'm or series character, of course their abilities will not be within my reach, unless they use magic. Greg. I understand, you plan to be the hero, which will be Issei, and the villain, which will be whoever you want, right? Issei. Exactly, and what better villain than a necromancer with an army of undead at his disposal? He asked rhetorically to the dragon, who only laughed at the brown-haired man's idea. Greg. I totally get it, you plan to have the population accept your reign, since the hero will be there to protect them and keep the villain at bay. Sounds like fun. Issei. That's right, it's a bit risky, but it can be feasible. He said and then began to walk into the catacombs. Greg. Maybe, but with the powers you possess I doubt they can do anything. Issei. I know, but I don't want to be a complete villain either. But speaking of powers. What are the powers that this gauntlet gives me? He asked intrigued while looking at said artifact. Greg. The truth is a lot, and how much to your abilities can be something devastating. 
To begin with, the boost gear has several forms, this is the first, which gives you abilities such as the dragon shoot or the one to double your power, or transfer it to someone or some object every 10 seconds, the second would be the boost gear scale mailer balance breaker. In which you are surrounded by armor which, for obvious reasons, gives you defense, also increases your powers, and finally, the juggernaut drive, which lets my power flow throughout your being, making your appearance change to that of a mini dragon, making you acquire a power capable of defeating a god. But this comes with a price your life. They say. And what does that do to? He asked, intrigued by the price to pay for such power. Dreg. Power corrupts, and we have abundant amounts of it, causing the bearers to end up going mad because of it, causing that when they die, their souls are sealed in the boost gear, and every time a bearer enters this mode, they are responsible for making them pay the same price that they paid. But seeing that that god brought me with you, I doubt that curse will affect you. He said calmly while looking at the brown-haired man. They say. I see, that can be a good advantage. By the way, you said we, but we just met. What do you mean? I asked doubtfully as I watched a bandit commit suicide with a trap. Greg. That's true, I haven't told you. In our world there lives another celestial dragon, Albion, who is my rival. And with whom you were destined to fight to the death. He said simply. They say. I understand, I must assume that he was also in one of these sacred gear right? He asked as he began to do the puzzle to open the door that blocked his way. Greg, that's right, in short Albion and I were having one of our countless battles, when without realizing it we intervened in the holy war, you know, angels, fallen angels and demons. Anyway, got along with the leaders of the two factions temporarily allied to defeat us, but since they couldn't, they decided to seal us in these sacred gear. I briefly explained while watching the brown-haired boy advance through the dungeon. They say. So you're sealed in this thing. He said looking at the boost gear. Greg. That's right, and all for a damn stamp. It's frustrating, you know. He said irritated by the mention of the stamp. They say. You know I can free you, right? He said stopping and causing the dragon to remain silent. Greg. How? I asked, stunned by the brown-haired boy's statement. They say. If you remember correctly, I can use any magic you've seen, I bet anything that I can overload the seal of the boost gear and let you be free. Greg. You're right about that. But there's a problem he said, making the brown haired boy pay attention the boost gear isn't what gives you the powers, it's me, the boost gear is just a vessel that holds me, and at the same time, it's a channel for my power, so that any human can use it. Without me in the boost gear you won't be able to access my powers. He said seriously and with a sigh at the end. They say. That may be a problem, but there may be a solution. Greg. And what would it be? They say. Simple, your abilities are based on magic, and as you should know I can learn any magic. I'll just copy it. He said calmly causing the dragon to be surprised. Greg, I hadn't realized that. You are undoubtedly the best carrier of all, a shame that the white one is not here so I can make fun of him. He said a little happy to have his say as a carrier. They say. Well it's decided, I'll get you out of this thing he said to extend his hand towards the device, but stopped and then looked around to say, although thinking about it, I doubt it's a good idea to do it in a dungeon. I doubt a dragon can get in here. He said, realizing where he was. Greg. Don't worry about the size, like any dragon I can take human form. It's quite simple. He said calmly as he looked at the brown-haired boy. They say. Can dragons really do that? He asked doubtfully looking at the sacred gear. Greg. Of course, that's not a problem, otherwise how do you think office has the form of a girl? I asked and then saw the brunette's face of doubt, which made him sign a drop on his head it's true, you don't know anything about the supernatural in our world. The summer eyes, Ophis is one of the three dragon gods, although the third is more the beast of the apocalypse, but well, it's a dragon that is on par with the dragon gods. I say. Well, it never hurts to know more things about my old world. He said to this time put his hand on the boost gear. After doing this, the brown-haired man's hand acquired a black aura which began to merge with the gauntlet, thus revealing a seal on it, in which countless smaller seals could be seen forming it. Greg. Do you think you can break the seal? He asked somewhat doubtfully seeing the complexity of it. They say. Yes, after all it is a seal, you just need to overload it, and that's it. He said to begin overloading the seal, which in response caused the magic sent to it to be diverted. Greg. I knew it, this damn seal is a pain in the ass. He said defeated as he resigned himself to being released. They say. It may be a headache, but everything has a solution he said, and then imbued magic into the seal again, but this time he sent it to the edges of it, causing it to move I have it. He said watching as the seal moved and revealed that it was divided into four parts. Greg. What did you just do? He asked, surprised at the brown-haired boy's achievement. They say. From what you've mentioned to me, there are dragon gods, and seeing as you, being a celestial, need the leaders of the three factions to seal you. 
I understand that the magic of the dragon gods is simply overwhelming, so what would be the best mechanism to prevent your release? I asked waiting for an answer from the dragon, which was said instantly. Greg. A mechanism that prevents magic from reaching the seal. He said, realizing the leader's strategy. If for some reason the dragon gods decided to release them, it would be the end for the three races. Therefore, the only option was to deny the mafia entry to the seal. I say. Exactly, these thousands of seals simply repel magic, preventing it from reaching the true seal that imprisons you. Therefore if I manage to fit these pieces together you say while slowly moving the pieces, until the green glow came off the boost gear it should open. He said watching as the seal fell to pieces and released a green aura, which began to take the shape of a human, until it finally stopped coming out of the sacred gear, causing it to break into pieces. Greg. Finally finally free sealed for so long, I had forgotten what the outdoors was like said the dragon, who now had a human appearance, which was that of a red-haired man with emerald green eyes. His clothing consisted of a set of light orange armor with small plates and gray metal boots. I say. How does it feel to be free after so long? He asked him used watching the repeat stretch. Greg. It's wonderful, even though it's a little uncomfortable to be in human form, but I guess it's just a matter of giving it time he said, and then picked up two axes that were lying on the dungeon floor, what are these weapons doing in this place? He asked the brown haired man, who just shrugged his shoulders. I say. I don't know, they're probably from some drogers that live here. Although if I remember correctly, they're further down, after we met the boss of these bandits. He said looking at the redeed, who, like his companion, shrugged his shoulders. Greg. Well, whatever, it's about time we go. I don't want to spend any more time locked in a dungeon, I've had enough with that damn thing. He said pointing at the boost gear. They say. You're right, after this we have to notify White Race to send forces. He said and then began to walk deeper into the dungeon, followed by his new partner Drake. Returning to the outside. Several minutes had passed since Drake and Issei had descended non-stop into the catacombs, in which, a cry for help resounded throughout the place. Thus stopping the two. Drake. Did you hear that? He asked his partner, who nodded and then spoke. They say. If I remember correctly, it's about the bandit boss, who is trapped in the web of a giant spider. Or as they are known here, freezing spiders. He explained while feeling a chill all over his body, which was noticed by the dragon. Greg. Is my partner afraid of spiders? I asked mockingly, which the brown-haired boy clearly noticed. They say. I'm not scared of them, I just don't like them. So shut your mouth. Greg. Haha <laughs> okay, okay. Let me take care of this, it will be good for me to get used to my body. He said while walking towards the place while taking out his axes. Once he was in front of the entrance, with a cut of his axe, he cut the spider web that blocked his way. Thus calling the bandit's attention. Darvel. Hey, you quick get me out of here before it appears again he said quickly and nervously, which turned into terror when he looked up oh no, there it is again don't let it catch me, I beg you dot the redeed, upon hearing his words, looked up to see a huge spider quickly descending its web. Greg. Wow, he wasn't lying about how big it was. After finishing watching the spider touch the ground, the redeed formed a small smile, which increased in size as it approached the spider. The spider saw him approaching, so it quickly raised one of its front legs to try to impale the dragon, who quickly dodged the attack, then cut off two of the spider's front legs. Causing it to lose its balance and fall to the ground. Greg. You're mine now, little one he said in his thoughts as he raised his axe, which was aimed at the spider's head, thus dying from the impact. But the dragon, not content with this, hit her again, in which, this time, she lost her head. They've really been in this place for a long time. He said as he looked at his axes. I say. Why do you say that? He asked entering the small room. Greg. With the force I used I should have cut off his head without any problems, instead I only cut off half of it. I say. I understand. When we get to white race we'll see if there's anything you like. He said, seeing how the redeed nodded. Then he saw the bandit, who had been shouting throughout the conversation. Arvel. Get me out of here now. Before something else like that comes. He said referring to the spider. I say. Sure, I'll put you down now. He said as he unsheathed his sword and a smile began to appear on his face, scaring the bandit. Darvel. Hey hey, what are you doing? Why are you looking at me like that he said terrified while trying to get out of the spiderweb, which was useless. I say. I'm going to take you down. He said and then launched a horizontal slash, which cut both the spiderweb and the bandit. Causing the latter to fall to the ground inert. Only I didn't specify if you will continue to live. He said this last thing with a certain grace. Greg. Was it necessary? He asked, watching the brunette begin to search through the corpse. I say. Kill him. Yes, because when you release him here on the way. And if you mean the way to kill him, well no, but his voice and his screams irritated me. 
He explained while taking out of the bag the object he was looking for I found you. After saying that last thing, he stood up and then stretched a little. Greg. What are you doing? He asked, looking at the brown-haired boy, who only continued with his stretches, and after a few seconds, stopped and spoke. Say. Below are the Draugrs, and I've gone through this dungeon so many times that I'm too lazy to even complete it now. So I'll take the opportunity to try something he said to be covered by a light, which gained height and volume, and after a few seconds revealed a huge skeleton dressed as a king. Say. I introduce you to Ainzul Gaon, the undead king who will declare war on Skyrim. He said while his eyes glowed red. Greg. Impressive, you really do look like a dark being. Say. That's the idea. Now let's continue, I want to get out of here already. He said to start walking until he reached the catacombs, where as he walked through the corridors, the different Draugrs woke up. But instead of attacking him, he simply knelt before the brown-haired man. Say. It seems to work. He said calmly as he looked at his new soldiers. Greg. That was your idea. I asked seeing the situation. Say. That's right, like in any game, there are always monsters of the same type, but with different classes. Well, I thought that if I transformed into something similar but of higher rank, those of lower rank should obey me. And it seems that I was right. He explained while creating a small portal, in which the Draugrs began to enter. Greg. I suppose that portal leads to a pocket dimension, right? Say. Correct, my idea is to have my own base, so to speak, but at the moment I have nothing, so you will have to wait in a dimension. He explained as he continued walking through the dungeon, where after a few minutes, a huge stone door with a gear in the center blocked their way. Greg. I suppose the object you took from the bandit must be the missing piece, right? I asked, looking at the images on the door. They say. That's right, I just have to put the correct order, and before saying anything else, a click was heard, and then the door began to descend, it should open he finished with a smile, watching how the door disappeared into the ground, revealing a large room. They say. Perfect, now to grab some tablet and get out of here. Being in here for so long is starting to affect me. He complained as he walked towards the back of the room. Greg. Don't complain, I was trapped in that damn thing for centuries he replied with annoyance as he followed the now skeletal brown haired boy. They say. I guess you're right, but it still bothers me to spend so much time in closed spaces he said going up the stairs, then crouching in front of what looked like a wall with writings mmmmm, why doesn't anything happen? He asked out loud looking at the writings. Greg. Should something happen? He asked strangely, causing the brown haired boy to turn around to see him. They say. According to the game, I am the Dragonblood, therefore these scriptures should give me the words to summon a Thuum, her scream. I explained as if it were the most normal thing in the world, although seeing the dragon's face, I knew I would have to explain further. In short, said scream is an ability which provides you with skills that dragons can use, being for example. I know, throwing a fireball, moving quickly, draining life from the enemy, etc. Greg. They seem like very basic skills for a dragon, although I suppose they are good enough for a human. They say. I suppose that for you it is normal, but for humans this is completely incredible, but this takes me back to the beginning, to learn a word, you were always surrounded by a kind of energy which gave you said word. He began to murmur to himself as he looked at the wall again. Greg. Maybe that event won't happen because you can learn anything you've seen he said calmly looking at the brown haired boy, who immediately stood up. I say. That is a very good answer, let's put it into practice. He said looking at the dragon, which turned its head in a way of not understanding, although it didn't last long. Fuss rode da he shouted loudly, causing all the objects which were not anchored to the ground to fly out, this being the dragon's destiny. Greg. Was it necessary? He asked in a monotonous voice as he got up from the ground and combed his hair again. They say. Sorry, sorry. I just had to test this theory, which turned out to be true. He said amused watching the dragon return to his side that said, we better get out of here, I'm already getting overwhelmed he said irritated walking towards what looked like a grave. Greg. And what are we supposed to do to get out? He asked equally irritated, although he quickly discovered what had to be done. Because a Draugr with armor and helmet came out of the tomb, who knelt before Issei and then handed him a tablet. Issei. So, we're lucky that this Draugr creature is below me, otherwise, I would have gotten pissed off he said, creating the total again, where his new soldier immediately got into. Greg. And I suppose that tablet was what you needed from him, right? He asked, knowing the already clear answer. Issei. That's right, that tablet is a quest item, which would be ordered by the white race sorcerer after arriving at said city. Therefore, we save time and unnecessary trips. He said calmly as he began to grab everything that was going to be useful. Once he finished, he began to walk towards the exit. Thus finally arriving outside. Greg. Finally fresh air. 
I haven't felt this sensation for centuries he said happily while enjoying the wind. I say. I'm glad you enjoy it, but we still have to get to white race. So let's walk he said to return to his normal form, followed by beginning to descend the mountain with the dragon, which dedicated the entire way to observing and enjoying its surroundings. After walking for almost half an hour, they arrived at a certain point that was well known to the chestnut tree. This was the path where three well-known people were fighting against a giant. I say. It seems that everything is the same as the game he said observing the battle. Greg. What do you mean? I asked without understanding. I say. What I mean is that it doesn't matter how long it takes us, this is like in the game, the events don't start until you appear or have some internship with them. He explained vaguely, making his partner understand. Greg. I understand. What do you want to do? I asked this last thing referring to the fight. I say. There are two situations. The first is to ignore them, which would not trigger anything. And the second is to fight alongside them, which would cause a dialogue between us and them. What do you want to do? He asked curiously to his partner, who only laughed. Greg. Isn't it obvious? Let's see how long that giant lasts against us. He said predatorily as he launched himself towards the battlefield. Meanwhile, in the battle against the giant. The only man in the group stood in front of the giant, who raised his club ready to drop it and hit the Nordic. He easily dodged it, but due to the appearance of the certain redeed he could do nothing, he could only watch in surprise, as the newcomer stopped the blow with his bare hand, then pulled the giant towards him, thus landing a blow to the stomach, followed by one to the face, sending the giant away. Greg. What a disappointment, I expected that being a giant he would have some endurance he complained, seeing disappointed how the giant got up with difficulty. I say. And what did you expect? They are normal and ordinary giants, they are not very special he said approaching the aforementioned, who upon seeing him, launched a blow with his arm towards the brown-haired boy, who with a quick movement unsheathed his sword, causing the giant's arm not to touch him, because it had been severed. Greg. It seems that it hurt him he said with some mockery watching the giant scream, who suffered a cut on his leg, thus returning to the ground, where the brown-haired boy was waiting for him along with his outstretched hand, of which a white sphere was in it. I say. Disappear, he said simply throwing the sphere, which took the giant with it, exploding in the air, leaving only a cloud of dust, which when it dissipated, revealed that the giant was no longer there. Actually, I think I was expecting something else too, he said, putting away his sword, and then beginning to walk calmly. White race and companions. After finishing off the giant, the brown-haired boy began to walk towards his companion, who was standing next to the three hunters, who were quick to start talking. Parkas. By Talos what is that force asked a man with black hair and blue eyes, along with a robust build and heavy armor. Rhea. And what are those sword and magic techniques asked a woman with short black hair, yellow eyes and a bit of war paint on her face, wearing light cloth armor with a few metal protections. Bila. Calm down guys. She said, drawing everyone's attention I'm sorry for the inconvenience of these two, but I understand them in part, your skills are incredible, they would surely be good shield brothers said this time a woman with long reddish brown hair and blue eyes, along with three marks on her face made by paints. Her clothing also consisted of light armor along with metal protections. They say. You mean the companions? He asked looking at the woman, who nodded. Bila. That's right, go to Jorsvisker, there you will find Kodlak White Mane. That old man has a sixth sense, he will look you in the eyes and know your worth. She explained while her companions nodded. Parkas. You are strong, so you surely already have a place in the companions ha ha I hope to meet you in Jorsvisker he said as he began to walk towards the city. Rhea. If you join the companions, you will have good stories to tell, she said as she began to follow her companion, leaving the brunette alone. Bila. I hope to see you there, be assured that you will be accepted. See you later she said goodbye, heading towards where her companions were, thus leaving the place. Greg. What are you planning to do? He asked, looking at his partner, who just started walking. I say. I'll enter the companions, after all there are several interesting secondary missions in that place he said as he headed towards the city, being followed by his companion. Greg. And what will you do with the main story? I say. I will follow her as normal Arya, although I don't know exactly if the events happen in a predetermined time, or if they simply happen when I want it to happen. He said thinking about how the story will develop from now on, but well, I will surely find out after arriving at Carrera Blanca, he commented to continue on his way, thus arriving at his destination in a couple of minutes, where upon arrival they were quickly stopped by a guard. Guard. Stop right there, no entry is allowed to Whiterun, well there are warnings of dragons in the area he warned, while blocking the chestnut tree from passing. I say. We have information about what happened in Helgen, he said bluntly, looking at the guard, who quickly moved out of the way. Guard. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. You can come in, but rest assured that we won't allow any suspicious actions. 
He warned as he let Issei and Drake pass, who passed without answering the guard. Issei. Wow this really looks like a city he said in amazement as he entered through the city's great gate, seeing its interior. Greg. What's happening to the city? I asked, curious about the brown-haired boy's reaction. Issei. You see, Skyrim is an old game, so the cities were quite small and bland, but right now this city is huge and full of life. I explain, seeing the big city full of people running here and there I really didn't expect this. Greg. If the cities have changed, could there be more side quests? I ask, thinking about that option. They say. I don't know, but for now it seems that nothing has changed he said, watching how the typical Imperial argued with the blacksmith to make him more swords. We better go see the Jarl, we will have time to do some sightseeing later he said, receiving a nod from the dragon, which followed him to where the Jarl was, where, again, they were detained. Irelith. What does this interruption mean Jarl Belgroof is not receiving visitors exclaimed a dark elf with red eyes, brown hair and light leather armor, unsheathing her sword. They say. I bring news about Helgen. He said his excuse again, causing the woman to sheathe her sword and make way for him. Irelith. Now I understand why the guards let you pass. Well, come in, Jarl Belgroof is waiting for you she said, watching how the brunette nodded and walked past her with Drake. Jarl. Were you in Helgen? Did you see the dragon? He asked, watching the two of them stop a few meters away from him. Drake. Not me, but my partner here does he said pointing at the brown-haired boy who took a step forward. They say. That's right, I saw how the dragon destroyed Helgen, then, it headed this way. Jarl. By Ismer, Irelith was right he exclaimed and then looked at a man who was standing next to the throne, what do you say now, Preventus? Should we continue to trust that our walls will hold? Against a dragon. At that question, the aforementioned man only remained silent, causing the dark elf to speak. Irelith. My lord, we should send troops to Woodland River at once. If that dragon is lurking in the mountains, they are in imminent danger. Preventus. The Jarl of Falkreath will take this as a provocation he will assume that we are preparing to join Ulfric's side and attack him. We should not. Jarl. Enough he interrupted, silencing his advisor. I will not sit back while a dragon burns my fortress and slaughters my people Irelith, send a detachment to the wooded river immediately. Irelith. Yes, my Jarl. Prevent this. If you'll excuse me, I'll return to my post. After saying that, both he and the Dark Elf went off to do their errands, leaving the duo and the Jarl alone. Jarl. It will be for the best well done. You sold on your own initiative. You have done a great service to Whiterun, and I will not forget it. He thanked them and then looked at both boys with gratitude tell me, what can I offer you as a reward for such an act of kindness? He asked without stopping to look at the duo, who looked at each other. Greg. I don't need anything at the moment, so ask for whatever you think is appropriate he said looking at the brown-haired boy, who nodded and then looked at the Jarl. They say. It's nothing out of this world, but I would like to get a fabric resistant to magical attacks, and if possible, black and white he ordered respectfully seeing the man's reaction, who smiled with amusement. Jarl. Just that. It's okay, I can do it he said, and then changed to a more serious face now, I know it may sound like I'm taking advantage of you, but there's something else you could help us with. They say. It's okay, what do you need? I ask already knowing the man's answer. Jarl. Come, find us Ferenger, my court sorcerer. He's been investigating a matter related to those dragons and with rumors about them. No sooner had he finished speaking, he quickly stood up to go to a room to the right of the Great Hall for Anger. I think I've found someone who could help you with your dragon project. I want you to tell him all the details he called as he entered the room, where a man in black robes was reading scrolls behind a desk full of magical utensils and soul gems. Varenger. So the Jarl thinks you two can be of use to me? I ask rhetorically as I watch the duo enter the room well, I could use someone to bring me a certain item. Well, when I say bring, I mean venturing into some dangerous ruins in search of an ancient stone tablet that may or may not be there. They say. Just tell me what you need me to do he responded sharply in order to finish this as soon as possible. Varenger. You are looking forward to your adventure. Excellent. The sooner you start, the sooner you finish, right? He said gracefully as he walked a little through the room, until he reached an enchantment table. I they have heard that there is a certain stone tablet inside the barrow of the Grim Falls, a dragon stone that supposedly contains a map of the burial places of dragons. Go to the barrow of the Grim Falls, find that tablet that will undoubtedly be in the main chamber, and bring it to me. It is very simple. He ordered while observing an object that was on the enchantment table. They say. Ah. You mean this stone tablet? He asked mockingly as he put his hand in his clothes, cradling a magic circle from which he took out the previously kept tablet. Varenger. How? The dragon stone of the gloomy falls how did you get it, he asked incredulously watching as the young man in front of him took out said object. Issei. 
I recently went to eradicate some bandits that surrounded that area, and when I entered the cave I found this stone. It seemed strange to me, so I kept it he explained simply while handing over the ancient stone. Berenger. Perfect. You're not like those brutes the Jarl usually foists on me. Jarl. Ahem I'm still here he said, drawing everyone's attention, seeing how he was still standing in the entrance to the room. Berenger. Hem yes I'm sorry, my Jarl he apologized quickly, not knowing exactly what to do, accommodating the duo's laughter. Greg. Well, now what can we do? I asked hoping for another mission that would serve to warm up his muscles a bit. Berenger. There's nothing else for now, this is more than enough. Although if you want to earn some money while helping the city, go talk to Preventus, he will give you missions suitable for you, he informed while taking the tablet and going to his room to study it. Jarl. Again, thank you very much for your help, young people. Tomorrow I will give you your rewards along with the cloth you previously requested. He thanked them as he accompanied the young people to the dining room. They say. You're welcome. We'll be in the city for a few days, so there's no rush. Jarl. That's wonderful, as a thank you I will give you some money to make your stay in White Run more pleasant, as far as money is concerned he said, handing over a bag with some gold coins. I say. Thank you very much Jarl, we will be here first thing tomorrow morning he said as he walked towards the exit with Drag. if you need anything just call us after saying that, both adventurers left the building, beginning to walk towards the center of the city. Drag. Why did you only ask for magic resistant cloth? I asked curious about such a request. I say. In this world, apart from solving problems with swords and blows, magic also abounds, especially in dragons. So I ask for that cloth to have double protection, that is, the one that comes with the cloth, and the one that I will implement in case the first one does not withstand a spell. He explained while entering a building, apparently being a hostile. Greg. It's a good strategy, this way you can be sure to reduce the damage you receive from that kind of attacks he said, thinking about the brown-haired boy's strategy to make things easier. I say. Exactly. Besides, I wouldn't like to keep changing clothes because they're breaking from battles, he explained another point of why his choice, then looked towards a corner of the dining room, where a woman was drinking alone, but now that's not important, since I have something else to do he said missing the dragon, who saw how the brown-haired man approached a woman with blonde hair. Blue eyes and two paint marks that reached her neck. Meanwhile, her clothing consisted of a full metal armor, while next to her rested a large two-handed sword. They say. What are you doing here alone? He asked once he was next to the woman, who turned her head to see the brunette. I've had certain problems, and that, along with being the best fighter in this hostel, doesn't help my relationships with others he explained, without giving it much importance while drinking from his mug of beer. I say. The champion he tell me, what is your name? He asked sitting in the free chair in front of the blonde. My name is Uthyard. And what is your name? I ask, now paying attention to the brown-haired boy. I say. My name is Issei, nice to meet you. He introduced himself while offering a handshake, which the woman gladly accepted, so you are the best fighter, would you mind having a friendly fight? He asked with a smile as a certain dragon approached to listen. Uthyard. Boy, looking at you I'm sure you're good with the sword, your style being agility and quick precise cuts. But my fights are bare knuckle, no weapons. I doubt you can handle me she said, looking up and down the brown haired boy's body. They say. Haha, <laughs> you're actually right, but I've also trained my strength, I'm not that bad either, you know he laughed as he put his nadachi aside, how about we bet? He asked challengingly as he placed 100 gold coins on the table. Uthyard. Is it a challenge? He asked, looking at the coins and the brown-haired boy, who only kept his smile on his face, then I can't refuse it he said as he placed another 100 gold coins on the table. I say. Wonderful. Then whenever you want he said once he stood up and got into a fighting stance, drawing the attention of everyone present. Uthyard. As you wish, but don't complain later if you get hurt he warned as he launched himself against the brunette, who dodged a blonde's blow with a quick movement, who, instead of stopping, continued throwing blow after blow, which were hurt or blocked by the young man. I say. Not bad, she has good speed for the force with which she hits, he praised her as he continued to dodge blows, then, after dodging a right hook, he placed his hand in front of the woman's chest, while two fingers pointed towards her heart, thus confusing those present with the blonde. Uthyard. I say. Well done, you are really good he praised again looking at the woman, who, upon seeing the brown-haired man, saw how she closed her fist and hit her chest sharply, making the blonde feel like her armor was dented, thus giving way to a great pressure which hit her chest, causing her to fall to the ground almost out of breath from the blow. Uthyard. Wh what was that? He asked while slowly recovering from the blow. I say. This punch is called one-inch punch. Impressive, right? He asked amused, looking at the woman's face. Uthyard. 
it's really incredible that with that body and that dry blow, you can exert so much force he praised while slowly recovering, it seems that you win this round, the money is yours. He said while sitting on the chair and bringing the money closer to Chestnut. I say. Thank you, I hope to fight you again another day, meanwhile, if you need my help let me know. Boothyard. Of course, and that applies to you as well. If you need me, you know where to find me. I'd like to go hunting bandits or something together someday, after all, I haven't seen you using a sword. I say. Of course, if I find something I'll let you know. He said while taking the money for today I say goodbye, and I'll pay for this round he said goodbye while leaving the money on the table, and heading to pay for the room, earning a thank you from the woman and the keys to his room from the innkeeper. Greg. So you use Bruce Lee's punch, right? He asked, entering the room which contained a small desk, a trunk to store things, and two small beds. I say. You know that punch. Greg. Of course. Just because I've been waxed for centuries doesn't mean I don't know about some things he replied, annoyed by the brunette stupid question. I say. Sorry, sorry what a character he whispered the last while leaving his things in the trunk well, tomorrow first thing in the morning we will go see the Jarl, where, apart from giving us our reward, Irelith will surely appear warning of the dragon's attack. He said as he fell onto the bed. Greg. So tomorrow we will have to hunt that dragon. He asked throwing himself on the bed like the brown-haired boy did God, how long has it been since I slept on something with some comfort he said, causing the brown-haired boy to laugh a little. I say. That's right, and after that we will focus on other things, after all I have several plans for this world. He said as he settled down to sleep good night, overdeveloped lizard. Greg. Buck you virgin he mocked annoyed, making the brunette click his tongue. I say. Why did I take you out of the seal? He asked himself annoyed as he closed his eyes, then quickly fell asleep. Story 2 What if Issei receives military training and becomes strongest soldier? The beginning. Before I begin, I would like to point out a couple of things. 1 The characters that appear will not have the same personality. 2 Issei will still be Issei. So he won't have a certain personality. 3 The reason why Issei is in this situation will be explained as the story progresses. If some parts don't make sense, just wait. Two people can be seen riding two horses, one was white and the other brown, their appearance cannot be described as a sandstorm was surrounding them. And it was to be expected as they were currently in Afghanistan. Suddenly, one of the men received a message saying that the weather was improving. So he decided to move forward with his companion. After a few minutes, the storm began to disappear, revealing a few ruins. When the storm completely disappeared, two men could be seen, one had white hair combed down along with a neat beard, he was wearing a light brown trench coat along with black pants, his footwear consisted of boots of the same color as the trench coat, and to complete the outfit he was wearing sunglasses. The other man, or rather, young man, was a boy of around 17 years old, his brown hair was tied in a small ponytail along with a black patch, his clothing was focused on camouflaging himself in the environment of Afghanistan. 1. What you see right now is under Soviet control. The man we are looking for has been held captive for 10 days. There is not much time left. He said seriously while looking at the landscape. The man then handed the young man a device, which he took and pressed a button, which brought up a map of the area. After taking a look at it, he closed it and put it away. 1. Kazahira Miller He was an instructor for the SAS, the Marines and the Green Berets. He was also an instructor for mercenaries in the United States, as well as having a stint with the FBI. That's the man you have to extract, you'll have to infiltrate Gwandai Kar, in the north. You can see where he is if you look at your idroid. The boy did as he said and looked at the map, then saw the town. 1. Take out your binoculars, do you see the village up ahead? Look up. He said as he watched a young man follow his orders. If you need information about anything, call me and I will inform you of what I can. 1. He shouldn't have much time left. I'd give him three days tops. The Soviets have more outposts, try to get as much information as you can to discover Miller's whereabouts, from this moment on, you're on your own. Make your name a legend, starting with this mission. He said before turning around and leaving, but not before giving him a pair of sunglasses which belonged to Miller. At that the brown-haired boy looked at his arm from which a red gauntlet appeared. What do you think Drake? Creating my own legend sounds good. Greg. He, me too, partner, but remember, Issei, your life is in constant danger here, this is not like training. It's a real battlefield. He said seriously to the named one. I say. I have more than assumed that, Drake. But I prefer to have this behavior than to have a worse one, so let's go at that the horse began to gallop along a path that descended from the small mountain where he was. It wasn't long before he found a small settlement with a few soldiers. So far he had only seen at most two small stone houses, with some supplies but nothing special. So he quickly walked around the camp a bit and then climbed onto a rock and took out his binoculars. I say. 
Ocelot, this was what you were telling me about before, right? Ocelot. That's right, it's a Soviet outpost, be careful. At that, Issei looked around to see an enemy, which was, so to speak, examined. On the right side appeared what could be called their specialties. It was a bit strange, but Issei didn't complain. From what he could see it was all E rank except for combat which was D. He continued looking around to see one more man, there was one at each entrance to the post. Seeing this Issei took out his and Mrs. Four and aimed at the head of the closest one, from one second to the next the previously calm guard received a bullet in the head. Causing him to fall to the ground instantly dead. Issei without any guilt or remorse stood up crouching to go towards the next guard. Greg. Buddy, aren't you going to hide the body? Enemy trucks are passing by here, they'll see it and raise the alarm. Issei. If so, then so be it. My legend will be formed thanks to this, I will be a shadow which leaves only death in its wake. He said without any emotion in his being, making Ocelot, who was on the radio, smile, and Drake smile. He then came to some boxes which were 14 meters from his target. Again, without any hesitation, he leaned out and shot the soldier in the head, who followed in his companion's footsteps and fell dead to the ground. With no one else in sight, he got up and searched the entire camp, finding some materials which he would use later. When he finished, he called his horse, which arrived immediately, and then headed towards his objective, but before arriving, he saw a small village, which Ocelot informed him was an outpost, and that he should not enter as if nothing had happened. So he decided to follow the previous procedure, this time he only saw four guards, there were probably more, but they were not within his vision. With nothing else to do he decided to begin the infiltration. The first guard was away from the others, as he was stationed at the entrance next to a machine gun. Issei, seeing that if he discovered him he would be riddled with bullets, decided to surround him and then position himself behind him. Once he made sure that no one could see him, he grabbed the soldier by the neck and pointed his knife at him. Issei. Tell me what you know or I'll cut your jugular. He said in a threatening voice, which had an effect on the now prisoner. Guard. There is a cache of resources there, he said pointing to a fairly large house, more than a house it looked like a small warehouse. Issei. Good boy, now sleep forever. He said to stick his knife into the guard's heart. Who could not do anything since he died instantly. Once he left the corpse he looked out onto the main street, in which he could see at the other entrance two guards next to a path. Issei knew that going through the middle would be suicide. So he went through the destroyed houses. There were quite a few obstacles so it was easy to get inside. Suddenly he heard two voices talking, when he looked through one of the collapsed walls he could see two guards talking, so he waited patiently until they separated. One headed towards the road, while the other stayed in place. Issei, seeing this, shot the one in his place in the head, causing his companion, who had not moved away, to become alert. But before he could do anything, he received a shot between the eyes. Leaving only three guards alive. At that Issei looks to the right, seeing that one of the guards was heading towards a secluded area, he decided that it was an opportunity. So he went behind his back ready to stab him, but he quickly had to go into a house, since another guard whom he had not seen, went to talk to the other guard. Once they were done, they separated, leaving Issei free to kill one and follow the other. The latter entered what seemed to be his headquarters, so he quickly killed him in the same way as the others. Issei continued his task by killing the remaining guards. He then headed to the headquarters, where he found a radio, which he destroyed to cut off communications with other posts, along with some files, which indicated exactly where Miller was. With nothing else to do, he headed to where Miller was. Once he reached his destination, he could see that the village where his target was located was larger than he thought, so he circled around it and positioned himself as high as he could. Once ready, he took out his binoculars and began to locate the enemies. Issei. Wow this is going to be a bit difficult. Especially when I can't wait for it to be night. He said looking at the time on his idroid which was 2 in the afternoon. Greg. Remember, you have 3 days. You have enough time to wait a few hours. Issei. I know, but I don't like to wait and you know it. He said as he jumped and headed towards the first two guards who were guarding the entrance. He again pointed his gun at the closest one who died from a shot to the head, but strangely the second one did nothing. Looking closer he could see that he was busy playing with his charger. Issei seeing that just shrugged and killed him. After that he approached an alley to go further into the village, but quickly had to hide, again, as a guard was coming down it. Issei could hear the man's footsteps, and even more so when he saw his dead comrade. It might sound bad, but Issei was beginning to like the feeling of sensing fear and desperation in his enemies. Suddenly the guard passed by him, so he grabbed him and interrogated him like the other. Issei. Good morning, I need help with something. He said calmly as he cut some of the guard's skin, who began to get very nervous. Guard. You're looking for the prisoner, right he's in the house upstairs, in one of the rooms. Issei. I already know that, anything else I should know. 
he said in an almost cheerful voice. Guard. There are eight of us in total, including me that's all I know, let me go he said terrified, since his life was in the brown haired man's hands. They say. MMM if you don't know anything else you're useless to me, good night. He said as he stabbed the guard in the heart, killing him. They say. MMM 80. I killed three, there are five left. He said to continue his way, which stopped when he climbed some stairs and saw three men around a bonfire. Greg. What are you doing next to a fire in this heat? They say. They'll be burning things, probably documents or some other unnecessary material. But that doesn't matter, they're going to die. He said to shoot the one behind the two, who didn't even have time to be alarmed. Since Issei had killed them in the same way as his partner. Issei. Three down, two left. He said to continue his way, in which he killed the two with a shot and then entered the room where he saw Miller, or well what was left of him. Issei. So you're Miller, I hope you get out of this alive. He said removing the handcuff and bag from his head. Miller. Who the buck are you boy? They say. I'm the one who's going to save you, so don't complain. He said while carrying Miller on his shoulders. By the way, how do you know I'm young? Aren't you blind? You already know your eyes. Miller. A man who has a lot of experience, he can tell someone's approximate age thanks to their voice. They say. Well that makes sense, by the way. Here, these are your glasses. He said to put the glasses in Miller's hand, who put them on with some difficulty. Oslet. Okay, you've secured the objective, I'll send a helicopter to get you out of there. Go to the meeting point, it's marked on your idroid. Without further ado Issei checked it, seeing that he was 400 meters from the destination. So he called his horse and began to head towards his destination. Meanwhile Miller began to speak. Miller. I find it hard to believe that a kid like you could have infiltrated and rescued me from that post. And you don't have the attitude of a seasoned soldier. Issei. Well. My attitude is because I'm only 17 years old, in two months I return to the academy. Besides, I'm not a weapon without feelings. He said the last thing more seriously than the previous one. Just a few minutes passed until he reached his destination. After a few seconds a helicopter began to land. But a fog began to appear. Ahab, do you copy? This is Pequod. There's a gas covering the landing zone. We can't land I'm going to turn back. Without further ado, Issei began to watch the helicopter retreat to ask himself one thing. Issei. Gas. At that he looked towards his only exit and could see four soldiers who were moving strangely. Suddenly they began to twist and then take a great leap and landed covering the possible exits. Issei. What are those things? He asked, becoming serious. Miller. It's the skulls they're the ones who attacked me and my men, they killed 20 of my men in a second. Then I was knocked unconscious and ended up in that Russian base. We're getting out of here. Now. Oslet. Issei, whatever that fog is is surrounding you, we can't see through it, I'm going to change the meeting point, head towards the area marked on you idroid. Issei seeing that he was cornered had no choice. So he began to ride towards the exit regardless of anything. It wasn't long before the skull saw him. To Issei's surprise, they pulled out machine guns from their hands, as if they had created them. Miller. Boy, run without further ado, Issei paid them no attention and began to run. Every step he took on the horse could feel the sound of bullets whistling around him. He knew he could defeat them, but unfortunately he had someone to save. They might kill him if he faced them. He ran for a few minutes. They seemed like an eternity. Once he was about to reach a Russian camp, the fog dissipated. As if it had never existed. Without further ado, he started walking towards the extraction point while they spoke to him. Oslet. Well, it seems that the fog dissipated with them. Once Issei reached the point under Miller's horse and then mounted him on the helicopter with him. Issei. That's it, but what will happen to D-horse? I asked since the horse couldn't get on as it was obvious. Oslet. Don't worry, we have a solution. He said so that Issei looked at the horse, from which a balloon of considerable size appeared, missing Issei. From one moment to the next, the horse went off absent-mindedly into the sky, losing sight of it. Issei. Haha, I want to ride that. Greg. Really? You just completed a mission that took you a whole day, and you also found the skulls, and all you can think about is getting on that thing. I asked remembering everything and seeing that it was already night. They say. Well, yes, the mission has not been very difficult, besides. If I think about those things, I will only rack my brain. So let's go. He said so that the helicopter ascends again to head towards an unknown direction. The sniper. Half an hour had passed since Issei left Afghanistan, in this half hour the brown-haired boy and Miller had been talking about why they had rescued him. Then they fell silent. Miller. So your plan is to end their empire, right? Issei. That's right, we seek peace for everyone and everything else. I'll explain more things to you when you're recovering. 
But well, the thing is that there is another man who wants the same thing, but in a not very healthy way. We still don't know much about his plans, but we do know that it will be by force. That's why Diamond Dogs was founded or I think, whatever you want to call it. He said to look out the window, which Miller did the same to see a bay similar to an oil plant in the middle of the ocean. They say. He introduced you to the mother base, it was built thanks to the money that my master had with his mercenaries, since that was how he lived. At that, several helicopters passed by him to land on different platforms, and then the helicopter they were in began to land. After finishing the pilot's task, Issei opened the door and then helped Miller get off. When he finally touched ground, he could see several soldiers in the Diamond Dog's uniform next to a stretcher, and next to the Mosulet who looked at them without doing anything. Miller. I will help you, for the benefit of the world as well as my own, revenge. He said the last thing coldly while looking at his now non-existent arm. At that the soldiers arrived, where they stood at attention before Issei, and then one of them handed a crutch to Miller, who was not very happy about that. In the end he took the crutch and walked towards the stretcher, where he lay down, but not before looking at Issei, who spoke. Issei. When you recover I will explain more things to you, for now I will only tell you one thing, revenge is not the way to solve your pain, when you finish off the one who caused all your suffering, what are you doing? You will have nothing to hold on to in order to live. Try not to take that path, it does more damage than you think. He said and then one of the soldiers put Miller to sleep, so that they could take him away. After a few seconds of silence and the helicopter leaving, Ocelot spoke. Ocelot. Issei I have to talk about how you will handle the mother base. Issei. Me. I'm good at combat, not financial or anything related to running a place. Ocelot. He, I already know that. I'll take care of that. This base now belongs to you he said, showing the surroundings with his hands to emphasize the base make diamond dogs the force it should be. And for that, you'll be the one to recruit the majority of soldiers, along with how to expand the base. They say. Okay, I can do that. But I have a question, how will I recruit personnel? Ocelot. To begin that task use this he said giving him a kind of backpack it's a Fulton recovery device. When you're on the battlefield just place it on the soldier you want to extract, we'll take care of the rest. He said so that a soldier would arrive and stand at attention before Issei. Soldier. I'm ready boss. Ocelot. Use the Fulton on him, so you'll know how it works, but first of all there are some rules for using it. The first is that the target is asleep or unconscious, otherwise there's not much chance of them escaping. The second is not to use it on people who are seriously injured or anything like that, as the shock could kill them. Just try it. At that Issei knocked out the soldier and then hooked the Fulton harness to the soldier's belt. As soon as he put it on, the small backpack expanded showing a balloon, which kept the soldier suspended and then sent him into the sky. Ocelot. Very well, each soldier you send will try to be persuaded to join us, if that is the case they will be sent to the unit in which they are most specialized. This one just went to R&D, they are in charge of developing weapons, suits etc. The more personnel you have and the more qualified they are, the more things you can develop. If you want you can start, just open your idroid and look for the option. He said so that Issei did what was indicated and then put his idroid away. Issei. That's it now what? He said quite impatiently. Ocelot. Anything you ask for will be sent to the soldier, he said as the soldier approached. When the development is finished, you can ask for it in the form of supplies. So don't be afraid to bring the essentials, we can always supply you on the battlefield. Soldier. An honor to serve you boss he said and then looked at a list its development is complete, you can order the weapon whenever you want. At that Issei opened his idroid to order his weapon. Which in a minute was falling from the sky and then landing on the ground. Meanwhile Ocelot looked at the soldier. Ocelot. Development has been pretty fast, what's your request? He said curiously. Soldier. He a well, he asked for something with the description of a stealth weapon with cutting edge technology, and it is he was left unsure when he saw the name. Ocelot, when he received no answer, decided to see it himself, except that all he saw was a box, which slowly approached Ocelot until it was in front of him. Issei. I'm a genius he said as he began to walk hidden in the box throughout the base. Meanwhile, Ocelot had a large drop of sweat falling down his head. At that, a helicopter landed for Issei to get on. Seconds later, the soldier's presence said goodbye to him, standing in front of him. Meanwhile, Ocelot watched as Issei left. It had been three days. Issei was arriving in Afghanistan, as his new mission required it. Ocelot. Your target is a detachment commander. Your mission is to eliminate him, even though with his skills, it would be a shame to lose him, so everything is in your hands. Boss arrives at Ashego Kalai and eliminates the target. He said cutting off communication. At that Issei got off the helicopter and then looked at his map, it was a bit far, but nothing that D-horse can't travel. So without further ado he called him and began his little trip. 
Upon arriving, he positioned himself on a high ground, where he began to examine the village. He found the commander with several soldiers. There were more than he expected. But he still entered the camp stealthily, since it was nighttime in his favor. The first thing he did was go to the guy who was in the spotlight, grabbing him by the back to question him. They say. Some information for me? He asked with his menacing voice. Guard. The commander is in the house, he won't leave until tomorrow. He said, stuttering. They say. And where are your friends? Are there more? Guard. I have nothing to tell you. He said gathering the little courage he had left, which went away when he heard his say. They say. Well, I don't have anything to keep you alive either. He said and then killed the guard. He continued like this for half an hour, in which he remained in the shadows, so that when the opportunity presented itself, he could kill whoever was in front of him. In the end, he ended up entering the house, where he found the commander talking to a soldier. So he quickly took out his tranquilizer gun and shot the soldier in the head. Instantly the two fell to the ground asleep. Issei then took out his gun and shot the soldier in the head, then took the target out of the house, where he extracted him with the Fulton. The four soldiers who remained around became alerted. But Issei already knew that, since that was his intention, to alert them so that they would find the corpses of their comrades. So without further ado, he ran off to ride D-Horse, which left the area. Ocelot. Target extracted, amazing Issei, it seemed like it was a game for you. Let's see if you continue like this in the next missions. He said watching as Issei left the combat zone in a helicopter. Upon reaching the base he could see Miller much better than the first time, so he decided it was time to tell him the rest. Issei. Miller. He said to be interrupted by the named. Miller. You don't have to call me that, just call me Kaz. At that Issei nodded to continue. Issei. We better take a walk while I explain a few things to you they started walking, while Issei spoke do you believe in the supernatural? Kaz. What about demons, angels and fallen angels? I asked looking at the brunette who nodded. Kaz. I'm sorry kid but I don't believe in that, believing in something like that is nonsense. He said to look back at Issei who had stopped. Issei. What if I told you that there really are even more things? Haas. I would think you were crazy, but everyone has the right to believe what they want. They say. Very well, I will only ask you one thing, and with it, I will show you that they really exist he said placing his arm in front of Kaz touched my arm for a moment he said to see how Kaz did what was indicated and touched him as you can see it is normal right? Haas. Yeah, what's up with that? Suddenly he noticed his arm expanding and he felt something metallic. He began to feel it and noticed that it was some kind of metallic glove with gems. Pause. What is this? I asked, somewhat alarmed. They say. This is the boosted gear, in this device created by God resides the Red Emperor Dragon, one of the Celestial Dragons. He said watching as Kaz walked away a little. Kaz. That's impossible, angels don't exist, let alone dragons he said angrily, then became frightened when he noticed the atmosphere was much hotter and a huge presence in front of him. They say. Now you're inside the boosted gear, and you have the Welsh dragon drag in front of you. He said to bring Kaz closer and have him touch the head of the dragon, which had crouched down. Drag. What the boy says is true, everything that appears in the legends exists, if not where do you think they came from? Every faction, even the dragons. We made ourselves known through those legends, so that humans would have respect or fear towards us, of course it all depended on how you wanted to be seen. At that Kaz fell unconscious, which made the dragon laugh. They say back to the infirmary. If this continues like this it will be a problem. He said to take him out of the boosted gear and take him to the doctor. Where he stayed for half an hour until he woke up. They say. You've already woken up, the question now is do you believe me now? Kaz looked at him and then spoke. Kaz. So that's what it was about when you said world peace and not the rest. They say. Yes, relatively recently, if we count the years that these have existed, there was a war between the three factions, which caused great casualties in the three factions, even in the human world. Today, an attempt is being made to make a peace or alliance. But there are many who have resentment, our duty will be to eradicate those stupid people. Pause. Okay, I'll help, but give me a moment to clear my head. He said to get up and leave, but halfway there Issei spoke. Issei. Thank you very much, as a thank you I will find a way to cure your blindness he said causing a doubt in cause. Cause. How do you plan to do that? They say. Blindness is caused by several reasons, but encompassing all of them they are divided into two extremes. One it is because the cells stop producing what is necessary for the eye to function properly, or to simplify, something is missing, so that the eye can receive the light and create the image. Do excess cells, such as an eye infection that causes problems. Given these two reasons, there are two possible solutions. The first is me, since I can increase my power by 2 every 10, of course I would have to find a way to do that with the cells. 
And the second is with a target, who is, so to speak, my mortal adversary, who can do the same as me, but dividing, of course he has the same problem as me. He said finishing the explanation which confused Kaz a little, who took a few seconds to understand. Kaz. Okay, I hope you find a solution, it will surely serve you better than not in my state. He said as he walked out the door. Almost two months had passed, where Issei explained the supernatural better to Kaz, in addition to doing several missions to get resources and money for the base. He had expanded it quite well, already being three platforms which were joined at the central one. At that Issei left his apartment house to head towards the helicopter, but was stopped by Kaz and Ocelot. Ocelot. Issei are you going on a mission? I asked looking at the helicopter. Issei. No, you know that I have to go to the academy in a week. So I decided to go to my city to relax a bit and take class as well. But still, what were they going to tell me? Kaz. Since you're not going to Afghanistan, there's no need, but hey, do you remember the reports we sent you about a sniper? I asked, looking at the brown-haired boy. Issei. Yes, the sniper who is killing every Soviet soldier that crosses her path. Pause. That's it, well we have more reports which point to it being one of the skulls. He said seriously looking at the brown-haired boy. Issei. And may I know with what evidence you have reached that conclusion? He asked, surprised. Ocelot. Well, he has the abilities of a skull. For example, physical enhancements that belong to skulls, such as speed, endurance, etc. In addition, he can become invisible thanks to a camouflage ability. They say. Just tell me one thing, based on what you tell me I will give you an answer. What does it look like? Pause. She is a girl of about 18 years old, her appearance is like a normal girl, and her clothing is quite skimpy. She said remembering when Ocelot read the report to her. They say. With that I have enough, it is not one of the skulls he said missing the two subjects, although Ocelot saw something coming the skulls themselves are not skulls, but rather demons, which I assume were servants of some demonic house, which for X reason have come to the subject we are looking for. From that and what you have explained to me, I deduce that this girl is genetically modified to copy the abilities of the skulls. Ocelot. So you want to create an army of super soldiers. He said watching as Issei got into the helicopter. Issei. It could be, but I'll stop him if that's the case. Pilot heading to Afghanistan. Pause. Wait weren't you going to Japan? He asked, surprised by the brown-haired boy's destination. Issei. Yeah, but it looks better to go for the sniper. Besides, it'll be good to know what the other guy is up to. Then the helicopter took off towards Afghanistan. After half an hour of traveling, Issei landed as close as possible to the place where the sniper was. So he walked towards the place. When he arrived, he could see how the road expanded, revealing the ruins, which welcomed him with a bullet that grazed his cheek. Issei. What a nice welcome. He said taking cover behind a rock. Ocelot. Careful Issei, she's the sniper, don't let her get to you. Issei. I'm not going to say that. He said to activate the boosted gear and go out into the open field. Which was received by a shot which was aimed at the head, but was quickly rejected by the gauntlet. And that Issei disappeared in a burst of speed from the girl's sight. Within a second he was behind her already positioned to throw a punch, which he missed as the girl jumped away to see how the bow she was on was destroyed. When the smoke dissipated, Issei left as if nothing had happened and then repelled another shot. Issei. With simple bullets you won't do anything, how about trying hand-to-hand -hand combat? He asked with a smile watching as the girl threw away her rifle and lunged at him with a knife in her hand. Issei quickly turned his head to dodge a stab to his face, the girl quickly responded with a spinning kick which was blocked by the brown-haired boy. Seeing this, the girl decided to make several attacks which resulted in a block. Seeing this, the girl decided to make herself invisible and then hit the brown-haired man's stomach, who did not expect such a reaction from the female. So he flew out until he landed on a rock and then fell to his knees. Issei. You sure hit hard he, it's time I got serious. He said getting up as if nothing happened and then placing himself in the center. He again began to block bullets coming from different places. But thanks to his enhanced senses he could hear where the bullet came from. Suddenly the bullet stopped, causing Issei to look everywhere, but suddenly he turned around and blocked a fist, and then grabbed his arm and wrapped it around the girl's waist, which became visible again. Issei. You can't do anything, I can notice your presence, and when you walk I can hear you. He said with a smile looking at the sniper, who reacted by breaking free from the grab and throwing a kick, which was blocked and returned in the form of a fist. Which caused him to fly out and fall heavily to the ground, almost unconscious. Ocelot. Very well Issei, bringing her to the base would give us a lot of information. He said quite happily and was then interrupted by Kaz. Kaz. 
Issei, don't even think about it, she's a skull, if you bring her who knows what she could do meanwhile Issei ignored everything and focused on the girl, who tried to commit suicide with a gun, but was stopped by the brown haired boy. He unloaded the gun and put it away. After that he called the helicopter and then handcuffed the girl, who fell unconscious. After a few minutes Issei left in the helicopter and then covered the girl. But when he was going to go to his seat he heard some noises. When he turned around the only thing he saw was the girl's blanket being thrown towards him, which blinded him enough for the girl to jump. Ocelot. He escaped, right? I asked, listening to the brown-haired man silence. Pause. Better, it was a danger to the base. They say. Well, what can we do? We'll do it another day. He said, shrugging his shoulders and sitting down in his seat. Fifteen minutes had passed since leaving Afghanistan, everything was going well until a fighter started shooting at the helicopter. They say. Damn, you can't be calm, not in your helicopter. He said as he positioned himself at the machine gun and fired at the approaching missile, which was a remote-controlled one. As he positioned himself, he quickly began firing, destroying the missile after a few seconds. They say. I remind you that I can feel your aura, either you destroy it or I do. He asked looking at what seemed to be nothing, and then the girl from before appeared with her rifle. After a few seconds she aimed her weapon and fired, hitting the pilot's skull directly, who fell into the water next to his fighter. At that Issei sat in his seat and then looked at the girl, who unloaded her weapon and left it aside. Issei. You don't need to do that, I just want you to do one thing. Tell me what your name is. He said waiting for an answer, which took a few seconds to appear. Quite. Back to the city. Issei, after hearing the name, looked at his idroid, from which the voice had come. It took him a few seconds to respond, and he decided to pick up the device and answer. Issei. May I know who you are and how you contacted me? He asked seriously since he didn't recognize the woman's voice. At that, a familiar voice was heard from the other line. Ocelot. Calm down Issei, she's with us. He said quickly, reassuring the brunette. Issei. And may I know who it is? He asked this time more calmly. Ocelot. She's a former colleague from when I was a mercenary, she's an experienced doctor. Her name is Naomi Hunter. I contacted her a week ago, told her about Damon Dogs, and she agreed to help us. Issei. A doctor. Do we even have a medical room for her to work in? He asked doubtfully, knowing that there wasn't a proper medical room at the base. Ocelot. We don't have a medical room, but I've taken the trouble to send some resources and funds to create a platform specifically to cover this field. They say. Okay, anything else you need to know. Ocelot. Kaz just doesn't want quite to set foot on the base. You'll have to talk some sense into him when you get there. They say. Sigh, it's okay. I think he still doesn't realize that I'm in control. He said and then turned off his idroid and settled into his seat. After another half hour of flying, the base could finally be seen, and as Ocelot had said, there was a new platform under construction. But there was one thing that caught his attention even more, and that was that two helicopters had positioned themselves next to his, making Issei growl under his breath. After a few seconds of silence, Issei decided to open the helicopter door, seeing that all the landing zones were occupied by soldiers, except one, in which cause Ocelot and a group of soldiers were. Seeing this, Issei decided to end this quickly, so he tried to jump. But Quiet got ahead of him and jumped to where the others were. Seeing this, Issei just sighed and then waited for the helicopter to land. While that was happening, Quiet had fallen to the ground, becoming invisible, and seconds later reappearing and removing the handcuffs. Soldier. Contact move, move he said while he lined up and pointed at the girl, who disappeared again, causing the soldiers to start looking for her. Ocelot. Hot springs he said, intervening in the matter. The soldiers, after listening to him, managed to see Quiet. She reappeared, but this time she was surrounded by all the soldiers. Ocelot. Grab her he said seriously as the last soldiers got into position. But then Kaz decided to intervene, interrupting the soldier. Pause. Fire. He said seriously as he looked at the girl, who looked back at him. Ocelot. Miller she saved boss. Pause. She was saving herself, you know which boss could handle that problem. Fire after giving the order, all the soldiers aimed at quiet again, but this time someone gave an order, which could not be contradicted. They say. Enough she'll come with me. He said, pushing aside some of the soldiers while making them lower their weapons with a simple hand gesture. Pause. Boss he said angrily trying to gain his attention, which failed since Issei had other plans. They say. I won't take my eye off her, take her to my room. He said looking at Ocelot, who nodded when he saw the brown-haired boy's gaze. Ocelot. Fine, take her away. After giving the order, the soldiers began to try to get the girl to follow them, but she didn't move from the spot. Until Issei placed a hand on her shoulder. Issei. See, I'll be right there. 
He said to see how the girl, after looking at him, began to walk, being followed by the soldiers. While Lise saw this, Loss approached him and then spoke. Haas. Boss you're going to regret that, that woman. Lise. I know. She knows our location, but either way, if she tries to do something, I'll stop her myself. He said seriously, watching Kaz stare at him. After a few seconds, Kaz left the place, but not before reliving a warning from the brunette. Lise. Kaz he said gaining his attention what happened today let it not happen again. Remember who is in charge of this base. I know your intentions are good, but keep in mind that I would never put my soldiers in danger. And even less if I can't fix it myself. He said and then saw how Kaz walked away from his sight. At that the brown-haired boy sighed and then took a cigarette out of his uniform. After lighting it, he approached a fence and then began to smoke calmly. Ocelot. It seems that you have clear ideas, right? He asked, looking at the brown-haired boy, who only turned his head slightly and answered. They say. That's right, I know Kaz does it with good intentions. But his insecurity along with his thirst for revenge cloud his ideas. Ocelot. I know, but keep in mind that he is used to another style, our way of acting in the face of adversity is very different from his. They say. Yes, I've noticed. He said while letting out a small laugh, which he passed on to his mentor. Ocelot. You know, you look a lot like you, father. He said, looking at the brown-haired boy, who just laughed and looked directly at him. They say. I had to get something bad out of my father, right? He said with a smile as he looked away at the cigar. Ocelot. Yeah, thank goodness you only got rid of the smoking habit he said, and then fell silent. Which was broken by the same man you missed them, right? He asked seriously, with a hint of concern. They say. Yes, but what happened has already happened. I can't change the past. He said remembering his parents. Ocelot. It's a shame what happened to your father. He was an unrivaled soldier. We warned him that there was very little information. But your father was a stubborn man, especially when there were hostages. They say. I know at least he was able to extract them in time. If he hadn't managed to do so, he would surely have cheated death until they were safe. He said with a small laugh remembering his father's attitude. Ocelot. That's what your father was like you're still looking for her, aren't you? He asked, referring to the chestnut's mother, who became a bit serious upon hearing the question. They say. Yes, I know it has to be somewhere, and that it will take me a long time to find it. But I trust that I will succeed. He said, after a few seconds, throwing away the cigarette and heading towards his room, being observed by Ocelot's worried look. They say, upon reaching the door of his room, found two guards, who greeted him. Returning the greeting with a nod, he continued on his way until he entered the room. It was a small apartment that had a small dining room, a room with a bed and a small kitchen next to a small terrace, where quiet was now taking in the little sun that was left of the day. Seeing this, the brown-haired boy approached the girl, who, upon noticing his presence, turned her head to make eye contact. They say. When you wanted to sleep you have my room, I doubt I'll use it today. He said calmly receiving a nod from quiet, who then saw how the brunette sat on the couch and turned on the TV. So the hours passed until the brunette fell asleep. The next day Issei began to wake up. Once he woke up, he looked around to see that everything was in order. Once he stretched, he headed to the shower, where he had to pass through his room, seeing Quiet still sleeping. Deciding not to wake her up, he walked through the room silently until he entered the bathroom. Where he said and then went out and had breakfast. At that someone knocks on the door, making the brunette get up and open it, seeing Ocelot and a woman with almost black brown hair and eyes of the same color, her clothing was the classic white doctor's coat with a skirt and black stockings, ending with heels of the same color. Ocelot. Boss, this is Naomi Hunter, the doctor you talked to when you brought Quiet in. Naomi. Nice to meet you big boss she said shaking the brown-haired man's hand, who returned the greeting as Ocelot already said, I am Naomi Hunter, genetic specialist. I will be in charge of commanding the medical group along with the tests that will be done on Quiet. It will be nothing, just a few days of observation. She said looking at the brown-haired man, who turned to see the aforementioned, who had woken up after hearing the voices. I say. Okay, I leave it all in your hands. Just let her out from time to time, it wouldn't be nice to be locked up all day. Ocelot. You don't think you're giving him much freedom. He said somewhat seriously. I say. Maybe, but I doubt he'll do anything, after all he could have killed me and he didn't. Ocelot. Okay, I trust that if something goes wrong, you'll be there to fix it. He said with a sigh, knowing that he couldn't convince the brunette to keep the girl locked up. I say. Very well, if you need anything, just call any soldier around there. He said looking at the doctor, who nodded. Naomi. Understood, although I doubt it will be necessary. I'll only be here for a few hours, then I'll leave it all to the cameras. I say. Cameras. The brown-haired boy asked, surprised, which made the doctor laugh. Naomi. 
Of course, you wouldn't think I'd be chasing the girl all day, would you? That would hinder the investigation, it's better to give her privacy so she doesn't feel overwhelmed. They say. If you think putting cameras is giving privacy, fine. He said and then left with Ocelot. Leaving the doctor and quiet alone. Thus the week passed before returning to Kuo. Where now Asei was heading to the central platform, being seen off by some soldiers along with Ocelot, Kaz and Naomi. Ocelot. Back to student life, tell me how it feels to sit at a desk all day. He said laughing at the brown-haired boy's misfortune, who just ignored the white-haired boy, passing by him. While this was happening, Kaz was paying attention to something else, which the brown-haired boy noticed, since Kaz kept looking around cautiously. Until finally he hit the helicopter with his crutch. Thus making Quiet appear leaning on the helicopter. Calling everyone's attention. They say. Wow, I didn't know you could detect invisible people. He said looking at Kaz, who just ignored him. Kaz. Where did you want to go, ha huh, he said, between serious and agitated. Ocelot. Do you want to go out with boss? He asked, looking at the sniper the day will come, as long as he's with you, I don't see any problem. He said this last while looking at the brown-haired boy, who remained expectantly attentive to the conversation. Ocelot. She's an excellent shot and a perfect scout. She's also perfect for clandestine operations. That's more than can be said for others. She said, earning a disapproving look from Kaz, who was quick to respond. Kaz. I don't see anything perfect about. But he said looking at Quiet, who glared at the blonde. Seeing this, Ocelot decided to take out his revolver and spin it a few times, then hand it to the girl. Ocelot. Here he said watching the girl grab the gun. Kaz. Hey he quickly claimed, seeing how he gave up the weapon. Which made the white-haired man ignore him. Ocelot. Blades. He said calmly pointing at them, which were moving determined that the helicopter was about to take off. Without saying a word, Quiet pointed at the blades, concentrating on them. But she was quickly stopped. Pause. Wait a minute that costs a lot of money he warned, causing Quiet to lower her gun, but with just a nod from Ocelot's head, he made it clear that she could continue. Without further ado, he aimed with his left hand, firing three times, none of which hit the blades. He then repeated the process but with his right hand. After finishing the action, he returned the weapon to Ocelot, who put it away and looked at Kaz. Ocelot. She can see each of the blades. And her great perception he said being interrupted by Issei, who passed by him until he was positioned in front of the girl, who looked at him. Issei. Do you want to come in? He asked without taking his gaze off the girl. Kaz. This is ridiculous she doesn't talk how are you going to keep communicating? He said, gaining the attention of the brunette, who just looked at him and then shrugged. Issei. I don't know, I'll think of something. But leaving that aside, I'm afraid you won't be able to come today. I have to return to my city, and there's nothing to do. You better stay here. He said watching as Quiet walked past him. Without saying anything else, the brown-haired boy got into the helicopter, which took off after a few seconds. Leaving Issei with the image of everyone watching him leave, even Quiet stayed watching. After a few minutes of inactivity. The brown-haired boy took a shit out of his pocket, which when he opened it, he took out a phantom cigarette. Which he lit, causing the perception of time to change. Arriving at his destination in what seemed like seconds. Pilot. Boss, we are in Kuo, we will drop you off at the mountain closest to the city, we can't drop you off any closer. He said as he began to slowly descend, until he was three meters above the ground. Issei. Okay be careful when you return to base he said as he jumped and landed on the ground. Receiving a thumbs up from the pilot, who took off again towards the mother base. Leaving the brown haired boy with a view of the city. Issei home again. Although I think that feeling was lost after a while. He said to nothing and began to descend the mountain until he reached the city. Pro problems. The chestnut could be seen standing in front of a house, this was Issei, who was in front of what was once his house where he lived with his parents. Issei. This brings back a lot of memories. It's lucky that Ocelot decided to keep the house. Greg. It was clear that I would, after all you still have to study, besides that it contains a great sentimental value to still live in it. He said making Issei laugh a little under his breath. Issei. I guess you're right. I better go inside now, otherwise the neighbors will think I'm crazy. He said entering the house once and for all, seeing that it was still just as he remembered. After seeing that the house was still the same as before, Issei left his things in his room and sat on the sofa in his dining room. With nothing else to do until tomorrow, he decided to watch a little television until the hours passed and he fell asleep. Monday, 5 a.m. The sound of an alarm clock was what sounded in the brown-haired boy's house, who, still sleepy, hit the table next to him to try to turn off the alarm clock, which did not stop its infernal sound. Issei, already fed up with the alarm clock, got up to pay for it or throw it out the window, which would happen first. 
But to his surprise there was nothing, which led him to look at his arm. Seeing that the sound was coming from Drake's gauntlet. I say. What are you doing? He asked a little irritated by the dragon's action. Drake. Nothing special, I'm just waking you up since you have to do your daily routine. Just because you're studying doesn't mean you have to leave your training behind. He said seriously, making the brunette sigh with tiredness. I say. Okay, but next time wake me up in a different way. He said as he went up to the second floor, where, in one of the rooms, there was a small gym, where he began to train until 7 a.m. After finishing training, the brunette took a shower and then looked for some clothes in the closet, taking out a black shirt along with some jeans of the same color, and then finishing off with some brown boots. Once he was ready, he put a watch on his wrist and then went to the kitchen, where he found a note on the fridge. Note. I hope you adapt quickly to the academy, remember not to attract too much attention, it wouldn't be good for the Grimmery heiresses and Citri to realize that you are already familiar with the supernatural. That would bring many problems and even more so since you are the bearer of drag. P.S. If you need anything you can call us on your idroid, we will bring you anything in a second. I say. Sigh he says not to draw attention to himself, but knowing how people are, as soon as he sees me the word will spread. He said tiredly as he grabbed something to eat and left his house heading to the academy. Greg. Well, as long as the heiresses don't suspect that you're my bearer, everything will be fine. Or so it should be. Without saying anything else, the brown-haired boy continued on his way, observing the surroundings and enjoying the atmosphere of the city. Until he reached the academy, where the students were entering the building, although some of them were directing glances at the brown-haired boy, who ignored them until he reached his classroom, where he waited at the door for the teacher to arrive, who arrived after a few minutes. Teacher. Good morning young man, could you tell me who you are and what are you doing here? I asked curiously watching the brown-haired boy leaning against the wall. Issei. Good morning, my name is Haidu Issei, I just returned to the city he introduced himself calmly while looking at the teacher. Teacher? He? Really? You've changed a lot, young Haidu. But where's your uniform? He asked in a firm voice while crossing his arms. Issei. I arrived in the city last night, so I didn't have time to order the uniform. He replied calmly while apologizing. Teacher. Okay, I'll give it to you today, but tomorrow if you don't come in uniform you won't be entering. For now, wait here for me to call you so you can enter, okay? I asked, receiving a nod from the brown-haired boy who waited for the teacher to call him, which didn't take long. Teacher. You can come and I knocked, looking at the door, watching how the brown-haired boy walked calmly until he was beside him, today an old classmate will join us again in class. In these cases we wouldn't need an introduction, but he hasn't come for a year due to family matters, so introduce yourself, young man. Issei. Good morning, my name is Haidu Issei, I hope to get along better with you than last time he introduced himself while remembering last year, where he was known as the perverted beast, although that changed thanks to Ocelot and his training methods. Although two voices from among all those there were took the brunette out of his thoughts. Motohama. Issei you're finally back he said as he stood up, drawing everyone's attention. Mitsuda. That's right, we can finally be a team again, and spy on the girls he he followed his partner, while his happy face transformed into one of perversion when imagining the girls, although soon everything changed when he saw how the brown-haired boy ignored them. Motohama. Hey don't ignore us he reproached while pointing at the brown-haired boy, who just looked at him indifferently. I say. I'm sorry guys, you're good friends, but I stopped being interested in those things a long time ago he said, surprising everyone and irritating two perverts. Mitsuda. Did you cross to the other side of the street? He asked curiously as he looked at the brown-haired boy from head to toe, on whom only a drop of sweat fell. I say. No, I simply have better things to do than spy on women. Besides, if you want to see tits go to a brothel, there are many, and best of all, it's legal. He said the last thing, glancing sideways at his two companions, who gulped. Teacher. Ahem, after this introduction, I would like to start the class, so young Haidu, sit in any free seat. Without anything else to say, the brown-haired boy sat in a secluded seat and then began the classes, which seemed eternal to the brown-haired boy, but luckily everything went normally. I say. How boring I don't know why Ocelot insists that I go to the academy if I already know everything they teach there. He complained as he walked towards his house with one of his cigars in his mouth. Greg. Because Ocelot wants you to have a halfway normal life, not everything is the battlefield and the supernatural. There are also friends and people with whom you can spend good times without risking your life. I say. And this is told to me by a dragon who spent his entire life beating up his rival, which led him to be sealed. He said while letting out a small laugh. Greg. Shut up, I'm a dragon, time is not a problem for me. I say. Yeah, sure, that's why you always tell me. 
OSA, I'm so bored locked up in here, I wish I could get out blah 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 he mocked, bothering the dragon, who would have responded if it weren't for the fact that a girl called the brown haired boy. Em hello, are you hi to say? He asked, standing in front of the brunette. Isa. Yes, is something wrong? He asked calmly observing the girl. My name is Yuma, and you see I I've been seeing you walk across this bridge for a while, and I'd like to ask you to go out with me. S declared while looking away and blushing. Isa. This girl is either a rookie or very stupid, she doesn't even know that it was yesterday when I arrived. It's okay, I don't see the problem he said shrugging his shoulders. Yuma. Really thanks, I hope you can meet up downtown this Saturday. He said happily as he smiled at the brown-haired boy, who smiled back. Isa. Sure, here's my number, tell me the time, and I'll be there he said, giving her his number. Yuma. Okay, see you on Saturday he said goodbye as he ran out of the place. Greg. Why did you accept it? Didn't you see that it was a fall? He asked confused, waiting for an answer from the brown-haired boy, which came immediately. Isa. This girl seems to be of low rank, therefore she is an errand boy. I doubt she made the decision to kill me, so I think there is someone behind this, someone powerful enough to know that I returned to the city yesterday, and that I possess a sacred gear. Greg. If it's a fall it could be one of the Grigori cadres, although I doubt that Azazel and Penemu are behind this, after all, one who still has a lot of interest in the sacred gear, would not risk endangering peace, well the other well, she's more the fallen one secretary than one of the leaders. He said amused as he laughed at the misfortune of the fall. They say. That only leaves us with two possible suspects. Barakiel and Kakabiel. I'd bet anything that it's the latter, after all he's a bloodthirsty war lover, and to top it off, he's mentally ill. Greg. You're probably right, but why attack you like that? What does he gain by doing that? They say. I don't know, it's best to wait and see what his next move will be, after that, we'll see if we get some information. For now we'll have to deal with the fall first. He said as he began to walk towards his house, where, upon arriving, he immediately called Ocelot. Ocelot? What's wrong Isay? I asked curious about the chestnut's call. Isay. You see, just a few minutes ago I came across a fall, which surely tried to kill me. I would like you to investigate a little what is happening around Grigori he said seriously while taking one of his cigars. Ocelot? Okay, I'll get to it right away. Although it's rare for the Fallen to move around Kuo City, after all, that's where Rhea's Gremory and Sona Citri are. I say. I know, but if he is who he is now we can get an idea of what he's planning he said seriously while taking a drag on his cigar. Ocelot. That crow is really crazy he said irritated while letting out a sigh, but well, the important thing now is what will you do? I say. Nothing in particular, I will continue the game of the fall until I reveal her intentions, from there I will see what I do with her, after all we do not know if she knows more about what that crow obsessed with war is proposing. Ocelot. Okay, but remember to be careful, and if you need anything, you know you can ask for it from the adroid. I say. I know, but for the moment I don't need anything, I'll call if I need anything else. Ocelot. Whatever you want, see you say he said goodbye while cutting off communication with a brown-haired boy who after finishing smoking, started watching TV lazily. I say. I hope the weekend comes soon going to classes, not being on the battlefield this is really boring, he complained as he let out a tired sigh, making the dragon laugh at the misfortune his partner was going through. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.